Welcome to Ruby Thursday. I'm Melissa Wanish. This Ruby Roundtable meetup was recorded on June 10th, 2015. We discussed what's new in Rails 5, led by Matthew Jording. Our host is AlphaSites. AlphaSites is a global information services firm that helps business leaders get answers to tough problems by connecting them with subject matter experts. The software engineering team builds the software that powers AlphaSites, including user portals and the tools used to source experts, manage projects, schedule and host calls, automate payments, and more. Thanks so much to AlphaSites and their engineering team for hosting. Ruby Roundtable is a unique, interactive roundtable discussion focused on a community-selected topic. Members include veteran Ruby developers, junior devs, and those just starting out. The diverse and inclusive nature of the Ruby Roundtable Meetup creates an original platform for debate and discussion while embracing core values of the global Ruby community. It's lots of fun. If you're in the NYC area, be sure to check us out on meetup.com and join us. So without further ado, what's new in Rails 5? I actually run a tutorial site called rubythursday.com, so check it out. You get tutorials huh? on Thursdays. <laughs> so, and clever. We, clever, yeah. So, um, I would give a big shout out to Alpha Sites for hosting today. Thank you. They're providing you with beer and sandwiches, a uh, huge projector and microphones, so you have to tolerate my voice. <laughs> and yes, now I would like to introduce Matt Jordy. Tell us a little about yourself and what's new in Rails 5. Um, sure. Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Matthew Jordan. I uh, program in a lot of languages. One of them is Ruby. Uh, and I do a lot of uh, projects, a lot of proje production projects for clients and uh, other people um, that uh, largely depend on, in one way or another, at least starting in Rails. Um, so, and I've been doing that for a long time. So uh, I like to keep abreast on uh, what's going on in Ruby and what's going on in Rails. And, uh, uh, and work with people who also like to do that. Who here works in Ruby and Rails? OK. Everybody, uh, all right, who doesn't, who's never worked on a Rails project? OK, so I know half of you are lying, because <laughs> you either work on it or you don't. And uh, there's about 20% of you who didn't raise a hand either way. Uh, uh, explain yourself, person who didn't raise your hand for either portion. Uh, I'm just Ruby, so. Okay, so you have worked on Ruby and Rails, but not professionally, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. For, I mean, professionally only means that you get accepted money for work. Yeah. So. Yeah. So how many how many have, are just new to Rails um, and haven't like gotten a job at it yet? That's cool. The other. Yeah, it's like three percent. Still a missing component here. We'll we'll suss it out. Uh, we'll we'll figure out the mystery. So, uh, who's heard anything about Rails five? Uh, was it largely due to angry tweets after a conference? <laughs> Halfway dealing with someone's hair product. <laughs> yes. No. Maybe. It might have been, because DHH is responsible for half of the angry tweets in Rails. Um, the other half are probably a man named Tenderlove, uh, and you have to choose a side tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Tenderlove, that's right. That is the appropriate side. <laughs> uh, no, nothing against DHH. He builds a company and a product that uh, we all try to make better despite him. <laughs> So, um, cool. So uh, there's several things that are coming up in Rails 5. Uh, if the chance comes up to uh, demo some stuff, I'm just going to throw up a terminal or whatnot. Otherwise, there's no real slides. Uh, I'd like some good participation. This is called a roundtable. So uh, people who happen to be uh, uh, professional Rails developers and Ruby developers, who, uh, who here has played with or looked at the new features? No? Who's a professional Rails developer? OK. Uh, who's brave enough to come up here and take a mic? <laughs> come on. 
just to have a conversation. Come on up. <laughs> all right. Yeah. You've engaged already. I mean. Ah, ah. All right, all right. I'll start you out and you'll warm up. All right, you'll come to it. Um, so what's going on in Rails 5? Uh, so Rails generally goes through some very uh, drastic changes with major releases. That's why a lot of us uh, will suggest to our clients maybe wait till a point version comes out uh, before you make major changes. Um, but uh, Several different things have happened uh, through the years, especially when Rails 3 came out, um, that have been major changes in releases. Things like Turbo, uh, uh, Turbo, Turbo Links. Um, what else? What else has been a big event? Pipeline. Asset Pipeline, which is kind of like part of Turbo Links in a sense. Yeah, that's part. That, Rest. Well, yeah, Rest was always baked in, wasn't it? Was it one? It 1.0 1 was the only one. No, that was that was when it went down to the yeah every level. But what's that? Yeah, yeah, two three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds right. Yeah, so two three was a big change with RESTful uh, endpoints, um, Turbo Links. What other piss, What other things pissed everybody off? What was that? Bundler, yes. Uh, yes, several times. I mean, to be fair, so did Errol. <laughs> In fact, uh, Errol, I believe, got a complete rewrite uh, about five months before it even got released, right? <laughs> Which was uh, pretty insane. So, um, so Errol is uh, the uh, relational algebra that fuels things like Active Record and actually uh, Active Model, really. Uh, and, uh, and allows you to use uh, um, SQL type relationships with your data. Cool. Um, so that's awesome. Those have been major things that have been disruptions. And why are they disruptive? Anybody know? Anybody know why those changes could be disruptive? Do you, do, who, who does a professional site? Who maintains a site for someone? Right? Five people or so. How often do you make updates to your Rails? Never. Never. <laughs> Why not? You really? <laughs> it was hard. It was going from three to four. Uh huh. You had to change. So there's two. There's two control. things you can do. Yeah. You can always stay up to date. Yeah. Right. That's one way to do it because the changes and the breakages are small enough that you can catch them in tests. Right. Or Tests. I know, right? Testing. Automated testing. That's a big thing, right? <laughs> All right, so five of you raised your hands that you actually maintain a site. How many of those people test? None of you. One person. <laughs> you, sir, come up here. I have an award for you. What is your name? You're our Rubyist of the day. Yeah, you do testing. Why? I don't know what refactoring is. What are you saying? Right. Right. It bakes in expectations for how your site should behave, or your software should behave, right? Which means that when you do updates to frameworks, even right, you'll actually see things break. Oh, which is awesome. So uh, if in an ideal perfect world, you have your project under tests that will run and you can go ahead and put a fork to it, right? Fork, fork a branch. Uh, have that go to your continuous integration server because they're easy. $20 a month maybe. You work with Semaphore I think as a free program, yes? Everybody? Who? Oh, I've never played with that. Okay, uh, Travis doesn't have a free program, does it? Code ship, is she, Code ship has a free, I believe. Yep. So there's several continuous integration is just they run your tests. Everybody should be testing. In fact, well, that's one of the things that's going to be changing in Rails 5 is some of the things 
for automated testing, some of the uh, testing support. Um, I believe, um, uh, let's see, what major changes do I have here? All right. <clears throat> so the test runner, right? Uh, if you do mini tests, right, which no one does, um, but mini test is the uh, is the way that Rails would prefer you do testing uh, out of the box. Everybody switches to RSpec, um, but the new uh, the new Rails test runner uh, has the same feature uh, when using mini test as you do uh, for uh, uh, RSpec, in which you can just do Rails tests as a command, and it'll just run all your specs, um, which is fantastic. Uh, it's new in Rails 5. Yep. Um, yeah, that was a. How do you pronounce Y V E S as a name? Eve. Eve's? Is it Eve? Okay. Uh, Eve Shen, Sen, uh, Sen uh, went ahead and put that feature in, which is awesome. Um, what else? Uh, simple things. <laughs> um, We've just got some great comments here from DHH. Like, uh, there we go. Maybe, there we go. You know, obviously, having both Rails and Rake commands for Rails is just very confusing, right? No? Maybe? It's not. Yeah. Right? But this is a priority. So we got to do it. Right? And that's fine. Because uh, one of the th great things that Rails has done, is it's, and Ruby has done for that matter, is bringing new people into the fold, into the conversation of development, which is fantastic. Right? And as, uh, as uh, more senior developers, as veteran developers, we should always invite that. Because that adds great things to the conversation and eventually makes us realize that people who do uh, uh, system administration and database support probably are not needed in my organization. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of a part of what has happened because of Rails and other frameworks like that, is that we ha have developers doing a lot of those jobs, or at least part of their duties. Um, so anyway. Uh, having both Rails and Rake commands is confusing, so we're now going to move to having Rails as the command router. And what that means is that uh, when you do DB migrate and things of that nature, you're going to now uh, be running Rails DB migrate, not Rake. I mean, you have a Rake file. Still, so I'm assuming, right? Yep. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah. Eventually, it will be a support request that we will pop into Rails 5.1 or 2. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, one of the things is to, I believe, do restart of your server. Right? <laughs> I think they're adding that in. I saw that. Right? But mostly, I mean, I believe, uh, so are you guys familiar with the Rails command? Right? Do you know how that works internally? That's all Thor under the covers. It is all Thor. Yeah. Uh, which, if you guys know, uh, Thor and Rake are two different ways of accomplishing the same thing. Right? Uh, who wrote Rake? Uh, Jim Warish. Yes, Jim Warish, who recently passed away, is a fantastic guy. He would ha uh, I, I had lunch with him at several conferences. Um, big guy. That's probably why he's passed away now. Um, yeah, yeah. But he was he he uh, he was fundamental for a lot of things we do, and he he definitely wrote Rake. Uh, um, Yehuda Katz, uh, who was one of the first. Uh, uh, contributors to J uh, Query, and also um, uh, Big Ember guy, uh, and uh, and responsible largely for a lot of the changes that happened in Rails three, uh, came up with Thor. 
Um, Thor is a great way to run command line driven uh, Ruby programs. Um, I've written a lot of stupid things in Thor just because it was easy to do from a system administration point standpoint. Uh, I'm an old Unix guy, so I know a lot of things like FFmpeg that allows me to basically do iMovie editing and uh, changing to video formats, right? I can basically edit an entire movie on the command line as long as I can remember 4,000 different flags and parameters. I can't, <laughs> right? So I just bake that all into Thor scripts. <laughs> and now I can do like Thor convert to MOV, right? Or something like that. And it will automatically append all of the different flags to whatever I put in to appropriately change a movie from, I don't know, MP4 to MOV so that I can put it on my Apple TV, right? Which is great. Um, Thor's great. I'm not sure exactly how nuanced the changes are to this, but I know that they're probably, I know that you can drive rake through Thor and vice versa. So they're probably doing some consolidation. And I've looked at some of the commits on this. Um, yeah, so they're also <laughs> doing rail, rake restart uh, and dev cache. Um, Rail test to restart spring, right? So lar largely I think they're probably driving rake through rails and they're just using uh, Thor as the command prompt for a lot of the rake tasks, uh, which is not hard to do. Because uh, if, exactly, yep. Yeah. Um, so you'll probably get all of your rake tasks still, although they largely may be only referenced uh, through the uh, rake programming interface and not necessarily like full endpoints. So I'm not sure how much is gonna be there when you do rake-t. You may have to do rake-t-v, right? Have you guys ever done rake-t? Rake-t is cool. You get to see all of the things you could do, right? A lot of people don't know that, it's good. Wait, so rake tasks are, they not going away? They are not going away. They may not be as visible. For the rest, specifically. Yes. Can you still make your own rake tasks? Yes, of course, yeah. Yeah, 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 the rake file is still there in the, co in the code base, uh, and it's still being leveraged, so that's good. Um, but when you start talking to newbies, and after five, you're gonna say like, we'll do rake, whatever, and they're gonna say, I don't, I've never seen that in, in Melissa's tutorial. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> huh? Ah, I know, I'll have, to go, I'll have to go back and redo that. I know, right? Yeah. You do, yeah. yeah, you do rails, DB, migrate. Yeah, I know, right? Doesn't sound as good. Um, what else is going on? Um, what was the big thing that everyone heard of from the conference? Anybody? The cable. Action cable. Action cable. Anybody know anything about action cable? Web sockets. Web sockets. Yep. Yep. So uh, for those who are doing Rails right now, how do you do your JavaScript endpoints? Right? Are you using pure JavaScript and Node and running everything through like uh, a, uh, a required JS um, JSON file, right? Support? No? Uh, how are you doing your JavaScript? Are you don't going strictly through the way Rails supports JavaScript? No. How do you do it? Uh, I build my front end separately. You build your front end separately. Do Yep. Which you could have sitting directly in your Rails folders. It's, but you know what I'm saying. Like, a, and you can start that way. I start that way now and then extract when I need to. Just like I do gems, right? I haven't like had those two next to each other before. A lot of people do. We use the asset pipeline for Okay, so you'd strictly asset pipeline. Yeah, it's not great for like modules and stuff, obviously. Right. The problem, the, uh, there's several problems right now 
if you're a JavaScript developer and you go to Rails, uh, because JavaScript has come a long way, clearly. Uh, one of the things that JavaScript has done is it actually has dependency management. So it's almost like there's a proper gem stack, right? Which is great. It's fantastic. We don't use it at all in, for, in Rails. It's not at all there. And that's part of what's missing. Um, how much that's going to be supported, I don't really see that happening. But one of the things that we've been doing is starting to support things like minification, um, all the compression that they need, uh, and that, uh, and caching and whatnot. Some of the things that uh, the native JavaScript frameworks are better at right now, right, are supported by the asset pipeline. Like, I don't know, like, we just haven't been able to do modules really well. Right. I, I, I can't, like, that it's just like what version of Rails? You're on three right now. On three? Yeah. I don't know what it was to be it's, um, it, the, the, There's improvements. And, like, I don't know, like, the hot loading, like, I don't know what I'm using hot loading, and you can't do that. Yeah, I mean, it's a model in general, and it's a bunch of very good that. Yep. Right, and a lot of us do keep that in mind, and I think uh, I think it's not a bad assumption. As a, if you're going to do a, a professional site, it's not a bad assumption to think that you're producing an API, right? And you are separately, especially if you know JavaScript, especially if you know JavaScript, you're separately building a uh, client, a JavaScript and an HTML client, to talk to that API. Right, as your uh, secondary portion of your site, right, and that's the front end, and that's sort of what Rails is doing anyway with the asset pipeline and things of that nature. It's just slightly tweaked, right? So now we get into uh, some of the changes in Rails 5 to support JavaScript, to support web sockets, things of that nature. Okay, what do we know about uh, Action Cable? Uh, we know that. Uh, in the middle of uh, RailsConf, um, uh, a man named Tenderlove, at Tenderlove on Twitter, uh, started ranting about how he was a core committer to both Ruby and Rails, but didn't know that all everything was changing uh, until the conference for Rails uh, came up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, which is typical. <laughs> Um, but it's fine. It's, uh, it's kind of the way that they collaborate. Um, action cable matters. Uh, Turbolog 3 matters uh, because um, you, uh, by default, will be looking at action cable and, uh, and uh, Turbo Lynx 3 as your default stack out of Rails. So when you do. Action Cable is, um, let's see, real-time messaging, I guess, would be the way to say it. It's WebSockets for certain. Does everybody know what WebSockets are? No. So uh, WebSockets are basically real-time messaging, right? So when you, uh, when you uh, what's the simplest example of that? Uh, maybe if you're doing a search on, a, on an input box and, uh, and it suddenly uh, pre-populates after you type a couple of characters, things that are helpful hints, right? Have you guys done that? You've done that. You've Googled things, right? It popped up with stuff. That's using some component of real-time messaging, right? It's usually doing it with a uh, very slimmed down JavaScript component. You don't have to do uh, web sockets for that. But uh, that's at least where you're starting to see that interaction. So um, have you guys played with Elixir at all? Yeah? Have you played with Phoenix, those who've played with Elixir? No? All right. Um, Phoenix has an integrated web sockets layer that's interesting. Um, Play for Java? Anybody do that? Yeah? Uh, professionally? Uh, yeah, my company was doing a 
Cool, cool. So uh, that also has an integrated WebSockets component. That's pretty good, right? Can you describe what you're doing in play when you do that? Uh, I've been involved peripherally in the sure. creation of that and not really working that. So Okay, fair enough. So you, you played with it in the periphery. It is fairly interesting. Um, um, play, f play is Scala effectively, right? And uh, which is good. Uh, so DHH um, wanted to very much bring that same type of thing to Rails, right? Um, so what you have is real-time push functionality to the web page. Say when someone's, if you had a chat interaction, right? Uh, say you had a, something on the site in which uh, uh, you guys are familiar with uh, on uh, uh, doing, um, say on Gmail, right? You have your messaging component in the, uh, in the lower left hand corner or whatnot or in, uh, in Facebook, you have messaging as well. People can uh, 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 directly talk to you on the site. That's very much using a WebSocket style interaction. All right, so uh, anytime anyone actually does something, it will talk to the server, right, from their web page, and then push directly to your page, right? That's the interactions that WebSockets are interesting. That's what Action Cable starts to do. So there's a server component. Yeah, it's mostly the JavaScript component, right? Because I mean, the Rails components are already there. Well, you need the push, right? There are still need some push. Yeah. Does yep. the server component use the back machine or something? Hey, so that's that is uh, that is very much what they're interact that they're bringing to the table again. Event machine, yeah. What's that? Is not dead yet. Why do you feel that way? Why? Why would you? Why would you feel that event machine is dying? Because of Node.js. Of course. Of Node uh, you know, it's been proven in many tests that Event Machine can do more robust work than. Uh, no What's that? Okay. So. It is not as accessible, is it? Uh, as, as Node. Why is that? Um, because Ruby doesn't have a great way to handle programming. That's right. JavaScript, uh, JavaScript by default has some functional programming um, uh, co composition, right? It's prototypical composition. That's how JavaScript works, which lends itself more toward functional programming, right? It's 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 under the covers, very much. Yes. Yeah. So event machine is going to be baked in, um, which which if you're using the thin server already is, right? You're using event machine if you use thin. Do people still use thin? Yeah. Okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. It works. Works great. Um, so uh, so that's that's event machine, and that's effectively like an event loop like Node uses, and that's going to be baked in. Luckily, hopefully, and if uh, and if DHH has anything to do with it, it will be invisible to you as a developer, right? The server end, the JavaScript end, probably you'll have to uh, hook into. Um, but that's that's pretty much what we know about Action Cable. Uh, what else do we have? Um, uh, keyword arguments in controller and integration tests. Um, also more of a mini test thing. Um, oh, uh, TurboLinks 3. Um, oh, and uh, Ruby 2.21 uh, and above. It's pretty new. It's very new. Yeah. Yep. What do we have now? 2.2? Two, 2.2? Two? Two, two, two? Yep. Who is on Ruby 187? How would you know? What is that? Ruby dash B. Ruby dash B, right? 
Uh, if you are on a Mac and you don't, uh, uh, on a Mac 10.9, right? Yeah? Uh, and you uh, and you haven't installed anything like RBEMB or RPM, then you are on Ruby 1.87. Straight up, that's the system default. Um, with what? Just homebrew. Yes. Your path and just with homebrew, yes, you can do it with homebrew. You can install your own as well. Or you can install a version manager, right? But if you haven't done any of those things, by default, it's going to be the system Ruby, right? Um, so you should have, if you upgraded it all to 4, I believe 4 was 193, right? Yeah. 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 So if you're running 4, you already have uh, solved that problem to an extent, and therefore should know how to upgrade your Ruby. Uh, but uh, it's going to be two, two, uh, one. Um, and why? Because, well, not sure what it was that they needed two, two, four. Uh, definitely half of the. Is that? When did that happen? No, so it's a, it's a, it's a, you can, you can install it separately, right? So Rails API takes a subset of Rails, right, and then adds the additional uh, API cooking uh, methods to it, right? Uh, which, uh, which is why adding it back as a default option in Rails uh, is finally happening. Does that make sense? I thought Rails API just strips out like the asset type like stuff. Yeah. So it's just, it's just, so it can't be baked into the Yeah. If I'm on the problem, it actually requires a different set of, like, kind of like the Rails query or whatever file, it requires, like, Rails slash all of whatever, to load all of Rails. Yep. So basically, all the load certain files from Rails. Yeah. So, well, all the stuff might be there, but one load is such a special. Yeah. Right, because you're never going to use uh, ERB. Right? You're never going to use, uh, uh, you know, any of the, uh, any of the, uh, uh, any of the visual endpoints. Okay. You can use whatever you want, right? And that's the beauty of a lot of these new features. Yes, these are the defaults, right? Uh, but that doesn't mean they are thrust upon you and you have to use them. That may be true if you're a newbie and you're just following tutorials. Right, but you will become uh, more uh, comfortable with customizing your Rails stack, and that's why people are doing things like JavaScript entire front ends, talking to a, a Rails back end. That's why people uh, have uh, you know Mongo as their uh, 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 database. Right? Uh, some people do, I think, still. There's like. I know, of, I know of at least five major companies in this city who still are running it. <laughs> Maybe. There you go. See? Yeah. 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 No. It's, and they're doing, and you know what? The Mongo developers are really accessible and they're very friendly. They're wrong. They're wrong. Whoa. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Who said that? Yeah? And, uh, and, and what would you do if you wanted a di document based database? I don't know. So it's not having it. What's that? Start with not having it, then it's many. Start with having office. See, and that's why we love opinions. <laughs> React is a perfectly viable alternative if you want to go that route. Right? Uh, anyway, Postgres does all of these things uh, for the most part anyway. So, any questions so far? What's the best Rails 5 feature? The best Rails 5 feature? The arguments on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> it's an optional feature. It's 
<laughs> yeah, it's a side effect, really, but it's the best. Um, I think uh, uh, probably the API being baked in. Uh, I think that will make people start looking at driving an API from Rails more naturally and by default. I think that's, you know, despite those of us who uh, think that Grape is better or another uh, framework driving, just having that there at people's fingers, right, and the tutorials that will eventually follow is, uh, is probably the best. Because again, um, Rails, uh, Rails does all things decently, right? Uh, which means that none of them are exactly perfect. Okay? And we can go ahead and leverage that, as we have been doing for the past eight years, to make rapid sites and applications for companies who want to emerge quickly and grow, right? Uh, and part of that is eventually you're going to want to do things like decouple your front end, de you know, change your database, start modularizing uh, what you can, scale to several different, uh, to an entire cluster of a database or whatever, right? Which means that having uh, features like Rails API makes that easier because you're starting with something that potentially is putting you on the right foot. So you build your Rails app and then you can turn it into an API more easily because it's already there. Yes. What does Rails API actually do? I'm just curious because we started as a normal Rails app and we have a JSON API inside Rails. What, we don't need to. Well, I'm just curious about the Do you have a, so you're right, you have the JSON serialization yeah. directly in there and you have uh, JBuilder doing some things. What you don't have is, uh, is the ability to just uh, uh, create the endpoints for your API quickly and easily. Well, I guess you sort of do. Like, you just add a resource in a route. Yeah. Now, if you have a JSON API, you don't need a bunch of them. Like, they're custom because they're all aware, right? Yeah, no, no, I, 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 I got the performance. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, if I just want a JSON API, I don't, it doesn't seem super so hard. You mentioned Virgin. Virgin is trying to relatively yeah. cover some tasks in Rails and if you have that baked into some sort of application or some sort of plugin yeah, like this, yeah. Yep. I'm just generally curious about is that the model serialized as part of this Rails API release? And I think it's sort of probably get like I think it's already in there. Yeah, I think it's in the current version or at least the pre. It's part of Rails API, right? It's part of Rails API, not actual Rails, right? Yeah. Yep, they've started to bake it in already. Uh, so I think uh, I think if you did I think if you do gem install Rails pre dash dash pre, um, the current build I think has it, but I could be wrong. What's that? Will they then deprecate JBuilder or will they have both JBuilder and AMS? That's a good question. Um, I don't know. Uh, stay tuned. Um, so Rails API. So the comparison of Rails API and and uh, Grape. Um, yeah, so who does Grape? It's a uh, uh, Integria, right? Uh, oh, Grape, Grape, Grape. There it is. Yep. Uh, who also brought us the much uh, maligned uh, Hashi? Yeah, true, Omnioth, which is awesome. Yep. Uh, use Omnioth, do not use Hashi. Why is Hashi Really? Uh, so Hashi got maligned recently just because you can, it's a uh, performance is awful uh, if you start doing everything in it. Um, whereas uh, you can do, um, uh, what's the, uh, yeah. Was that hip, hipster struts? struts? Yeah. Really? It struts has been around forever. How can you? How could you call it hipster? Really? Yeah. Struts are great. Um, so uh, yeah, you can, and it's better performance, right? 
Um, so there's a, a Ruby, Ruby has built into it um, struct, right? And more so uh, open struct, which is I think what people start to use when they start leaning toward uh, hashy, right? Hashy mashy. Um, the problem with the Ruby built in is that struct is too close. And open struct is too close. It's not. That's why you want something. Okay, I see. Well, which is horrible performance. Maybe maybe you should look at what you're doing for both. And yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. All right. All right. Fair enough. Listen to Ruby Rogues. Make your own decisions. Right. Yes, you can. What's the easiest way to install Rails 5? To what? Install Rails 5? Uh, take the fork from the uh, from the Git and install it now. I don't think it's on pre, so. Yeah, I can't find that uh, It's not tagged yet? It's on the Mm-hmm. Right, so what do we have now? What's the current? Four two three. What's up? Yeah. Uh, well, no, it's not the RC. So it's probably just a. If you want to play with the new features in Rails, you're probably going to have to take a look at either certain tags that have the certain features on them, right? Try them out separately, or just go straight to uh, uh, install the uh, Rails directly from the uh, nub on uh, on GitHub, right? Uh, which is probably the best way to do it. I think uh, uh, Pre is still doing for. Okay. Really? I thought 421 was done. It's not, it's not fully released yet? Uh, no, it is fully released, but there's, I guess. Well, if, if it's still on RC, then it's a release candidate, yeah. and that's not a full release. 421 is fully released? Yeah, no, 421. Oh, 421. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was fully released, but it's not. So maybe it's just the way that it's sorted. Yep. It's probably released. Way the are just on top. Yep. So, uh, any other questions immediately? So, so um, I rewatched the the DHH um, talk. Talk. What? And he focused on how Turbo Lens Three and Action Cable yes. help small teams. Mm -hmm. How does it help larger? Does it help larger teams? He focused so, on the small team. When you have a small team, how many people are doing the front end? One. Which is the same person that's doing the back end. <laughs> Generally. Yep. Okay, sure. Okay. Uh, and you have how many features coming in? All of them. Right? Because you're building the entire core initial releases. Right? That's why it helps small teams. Okay. That's what he's saying. Um, and he's right for the most part. Um, you know, those of us who have strong opinions and like to uh, start out with what we want the future of the product to be from an engineering perspective uh, may not want that immediately. Right? Does it help larger teams at all? Uh, it probably helps, like I say, uh, having, uh, having ac action cable. Um, yeah, it helps larger teams make transitions to the features that they want because you're actually using some of the uh, fundamental things that you want to put in your product without really doing things, really departing from the Rails way. Okay? So. Things are good for like really style stuff. That's why it's good for small teams, right? Minimal viable product. But larger teams also build prototypes and stuff like that. Prototypes, yeah. If you're building like world MSD like a prototype and you want to like get just a sense, you're not gonna build your like a real architecture based on sort of that technology. I think you need mm -hmm. But like when you're when you want to just iterate quickly and just kinda of get the general like working demo, like I think that's good like some turbo lanes and action cables and what you can that. And when you want to build like a serious architecture that has really support, you know, large more users and a piece of world. Yep. Um, so where did uh, uh, what did you watch it on? 
Just the RailsConf uh, YouTube or? Yeah, I found it from a blog. Yep. That linked to the, the RailsConf and then right to the, like, at two hours or something. Mm hmm. Um, so there's a, uh, what's the site that does most of the, like, conference talks? Conference. What's that? Confreaks, yep. <laughs> Confreaks, or, yeah, you can find everything on YouTube, but it's kind of like uh, you never know what you're going to get for, uh, for a, 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 a random search for Rails 5, right? Um, Confreaks is really good. Um, and uh, otherwise, go directly to the conference. Uh, I think one out of every 20 conferences uh, puts up actual links to the talks after they do it, which is, I guess, good, right? Otherwise, you have to hunt down, look at the schedule, find the speaker, and then look up the talk, which is kind of annoying. Confreaks does that for you. Um, cool. What else? What else is interesting? What? Um, so I think uh, aside from the interface stuff that's getting into the weeds that I started to put up, right, uh, I haven't heard anything. Um, so no major features, yeah, as far as I know. Uh, but, you know, it's just like the Rails team to drop that in at the last minute, right? Uh, a lot of the Arrow stuff was dropped in the last minute. Right? I think object model was a very last minute thing uh, to uh, uh, change, which is the last six months of development for three. Um, so. I read online that there would be better support for single page applications. Well, that's because of, because of the better turbo link support, because of the uh, uh, action cable. Action cable allows you to, to uh, so be, uh, one of the great things is having push right, to your site allows you to update components of your web page without reloading, right? And that's just more conducive to a single page app. So the way that I do that application is I disable That's fine. I think it changes What do you use? I So what does TurboLinks do? Uh, what's that? <coughs> what do you use as an alternative to TurboLinks? Okay. Handlebars. Handlebars is good. Yeah. What do you use? You're using you're using a full JavaScript application as your front end. Uh, I mean, that would be my choice. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, you, are you doing much JavaScript? Um, yeah, I'm doing. Do what, jQuery? I'm using a lot of, yeah, I'm using like basically jQuery. Sure. Okay. You're going to, you're going to, uh, you're going to need to learn that. Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like, I've played around with like Angular and Backbone, but. Sure. It can be confusing. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, if you're not familiar with CoffeeScript, one thing uh, that's great to know about is uh, you have uh, uh, JS to Coffee, right? Uh, um, which. Uh, allows you to just drop in JavaScript and I'll do the translation. You have those same tools on the command line, right? But uh, if you're interested in, uh, in playing around with coffee scripts, this is a very useful tool um, and that eventually you can actually use the uh, NPM node uh, module and just do it on the command line if you like. Sure. So is that, um, so is that no longer part of action controller, not part of action cable? I'm not sure that I've actually used the streaming, so I'm not sure. Is that the picture? Yeah. Oh. So usually, I think, I'm afraid the order, we usually run this layout and then combine. Oh, yeah, that's cool. That's actually the original part. Yeah. 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 So then, is that the same thing as the WebSocket? It's not. No. Nope. 
capture Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that probably, um, you know, that's part of, the, part of the same technology that they'll be leveraging to create uh, action cable style work. But no, it's not WebSockets. WebSockets is, uh, is going to be leveraged on top of that uh, to make single page apps and just responsive uh, web pages and things of that nature. What are these little beer? Because we have like HTTP2 coming down pretty soon. And, you know, the, I mean, there Nope. Sitting up there next time. Yeah, that's the majority of what I have. Uh, any other questions we can address and I think we can play with? You said there's, there's, there's not a package manager for Cox code? They do not have required JS uh, currently in, uh, as part of Rails, right? So you don't really, you're not leveraging any of the package management tools that JavaScript has available uh, by default in rent. But you can. You can. You, can. Bauer. And you should. Bower is great. Bower is fantastic. Yep. Uh, what are the other ones? Well, yeah, you can run by default uh, to uh, build a lot of those same things, right? Uh, and then there's a new one on top of Grunt that a lot of people have been using is like this other one. What's that? Project now? Uh, yeah, I'm talking about Webpack. And what's that now? Webpack gives you common JS modules. Okay, common JS is cool, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so uh, if you want to, you want to use that if you have a lot of JavaScript going on, especially if you want to keep things up to date and manage dependencies. Um, I think it's a good thing you should too, especially if you're more attentive to your JavaScript on your application. Okay. <laughs> right? Anybody okay. else? So, if you have a Rails 4 app right now, yes. Why would you want to use Rails 5 unless you were. You, because you'll have to. <laughs> you will have to eventually upgrade your Rails stack. Right? Who here is running 1.0? 2.x Rails? Anybody? Anybody running a Rails 2.x? Okay. Why have you not upgraded? Out. Wait. No, no, I'm sorry. You're thinking of Ruby. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, right. So, uh, and these these iterations have come fast. What? Uh, like when was a uh, when was who's still running a Rails three app? Okay, uh, that's a that's a thin group, right? Why haven't you updated? Hundreds of thousands of lines of code. You think that you're going to have to change hundreds of thousands of lines of code? No, but the certain amount of test coverage and confidence is. So you're not confident in making the change, and there's not an investment to do that. You have to prioritize. Right, of course. I mean that's, but uh, you know, you probably should. Or you know, as you grow software, you can also modularize and break things off. Right. And that's where you start to get really good, uh, uh, really encouraging thought that people are using APIs, and you can actually develop small uh, code bases, right, for APIs, release them as separate uh, uh, endpoints. They can even use the same database, right, uh, at times. Um, and uh, and then you can release to a single page app or some uh, client. And then you also have support 
for mobile apps as well, uh, because the mobile apps can use a RESTful endpoint for an API, et cetera, right? You start to do that, then you can actually have small sets of code with decent coverage that you're uh, actually testing. Once you do that, uh, you basically have an upgrade path, and you can you can go from uh, four now to five fairly easily, right? Uh, or five to whatever fairly easily. Great, because the team moves quickly, right? The rail team moves quickly, which means two things. There are going to be patches that you need to put on, and uh, there's going to be new features that will make your life easier. Right? If you have a fork of your code base that's constantly running the latest edge version of Rails, right? you always know what's, uh, what's coming down the pike that is going to affect your app, and you can have test coverage on both, so you know what's in production, you know what's on your uh, Rails edge side, and you basically insert new patches and whatnot to your code base, and that iterative development means that you don't have to change hundreds of thousands of lines of code and be stuck in an ancient version of a technology like some poor COBOL developer. <laughs> right? So, so I guess this is a pleasure. Um, when, you, when you tune this up, when you, when you uh, introduce people to the system, I, sure. I introduce them to, to the latest or yes. Because what happens when they install gem install rails? So this is like if you look at um we just talked about the AOT the Mm-hmm. Um the documentation I feel like they'll probably more than a few references to the examples, right? Yeah, and that's why guys dot uh, ruby on rails dot com exists, right? And guides? So, the, the ruby guides? Uh, hey, let's see. Uh, guides? Yeah. Uh, that's the wrong one. Rails guides, right? And you also have uh, Edge guides, right? Which will be pre version, right? So yeah, this these are both great documents for newbies. Also, there's a thousand there's a thousand boot camps out there, right? Uh, you can go to Flatiron, you can go to uh, General Assembly, you can take deep uh, dives into any of it, uh, and uh, and at least both of those I know uh, get good teachers. At the very least, uh, and uh, you know, I've known a lot of the teachers who've gone through this program. They definitely keep their tutorials up to date. Right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I always introduce the latest because that's what people are going to be playing with when they install it, right? But I mean, like when you're teaching Rails to new people, it's up to teaching uh, programming, right, for the first time, right? A lot of times you actually have to tell people how how uh, you know to use a terminal, right? A lot of things. So there's a there's a lot to learn, and uh, and the thing that I always teach is that when you are learning all of this, you're not going to stop, right? It's not like I got a degree in software engineering and now I am a software engineer and I do not need to actually learn anything about my profession, uh, you know, for ten years. That's not the way it works. Basically, you are constantly updating your knowledge base. Right? And going to GitHub and seeing what is going on with every piece of software that you're working on an active basis. Right? So, you know, I think at least 10% of your time as a software developer is on uh, just increasing your knowledge base. So. Cool. Well, thanks, uh, thanks for coming, guys. Thanks so much for watching this Ruby Roundtable Meetup. If you are not already on the Ruby Thursday mailing list, head on over to rubythursday.com to sign up to get more Ruby Thursday awesomeness in your inbox. Thanks again for watching. See you soon.